So in our second video for today, I'm going to be talking about control of the cell cycle. So we just finished talking about mitosis and cytokinesis. And now we're going to talk about how these processes are controlled during cell division and what controls whether or not cell division occurs. And I'm going to present this uh, lecture in a little bit of a different format than the textbook. First, I'm going to be talking a little bit about CDKs and cyclins, the proteins that regulate the cell cycle. Then I'm going to introduce the experimental evidence that showed researchers that these are the proteins involved. And then we're going to finish by talking about checkpoints and cancer. Okay, so let's dive into the control of the cell cycle. So the cell cycle can vary greatly among different cell types. And this is mostly due to variation in the length of the G1 phase. So there can be cells that are rapidly dividing um, and this essentially eliminates the G1 phase in those cells. And an example of rapidly dividing cells are intestinal cells. And these divide about twice every day. So that's a pretty short time for cells to duplicate their DNA and then separate via mitosis. Some terminally differentiated cells, which means that they've, um, they've acquired their differentiation status, they have a really important function they're playing in the body, they arrest in G1. And we refer to that when they're permanently arrested in G1, we refer to that as, G, as G0 state. And this can include things like neurons and muscle cells, and here I'm showing a, a rat neuron. There's also cells that can change their division rate in response to an environmental cue. And so in an immune response, some T cells that recognize the pathogen, they can up their division so that they can divide every six to eight hours. So this is an incredibly fast process for this, these cells to divide. So there's a lot of variability, mostly in this G1 phase, but this altogether suggests, this differences in timing, suggests that this pathway is regulated. So how is mitosis regulated? The cell cycle is controlled cyclically by these proteins called cyclin-dependent de kinases, okay? So these are kinases, which means they um, take ATP and they pull off one of the phosphates and add it to a new substrate. But CDKs, as I'll call them, for short for cyclin-dependent kinases, can only become active when bound to a regulatory protein called cyclin, and that's shown here in green. And when it's bound to cyclin, it'll, it has the potential to be active, and I'll talk more about exactly how it gets active in a little bit. There are different CDK cyclins that mediate the different stages of the cell cycle. So there are pairs that mediate G1, G1 to S, S and M. But for the purpose of, of at least most of this lecture, I'm gonna focus on the M phase cyclin CDKs known as MPF or M phase promoting factor. And first I'm gonna tell you how MPF was discovered then how the cyclins were discovered and how we know how they work. And then finally, we're gonna talk about how cyclins and CDKs work together and what might those CDKs target once they're activated. So the first question I'll address is how was MPF discovered? And so scientists were doing these experiments where they were fusing together cells in different stages of the cell cycle. So they could fuse a cell that was undergoing mitosis with a cell that was in interphase, and they would produce this cell with two nuclei. And if they waited, that intact nuclei would eventually undergo mitosis. And so if one cell was in mitosis, then the other nuclei would begin mitosis. Okay, so this led scientists to pose a question, which was, is there something in the cytoplasm that starts mitosis? But these experiments fusing the cells and because these cells are so small, it was really difficult to control. And so that's when scientists turned to this model system using eggs from the South African clawed frogs. And these eggs have the advantage of the fact that they're just very big um, and they're very easy to manipulate. So what happens with these eggs is that these eggs can be in this immature form called an immature oocyte. 
And these eggs are arrested in G2, so their nuclei are attacked, intact. And with some sort of maturation event, the egg will mature and it will be arrested in M phase. And what's really nice about these cells, as I mentioned, is that they're fairly large. They're about one millimeter in diameter. And so this can allow scientists to basically insert a pipette into the cytoplasm and suck out some of the cytoplasm from these cells. And we can now do transfer experiments to see if there's something in the cytoplasm that's causing mitosis. And so here's the, here's the experiments, or here's a cartoon of what those experiments showed. So if they collected cytoplasm from a mature egg that was arrested in mitosis and injected that into an immature oocyte, what happened was that immature oocyte then underwent mitosis. So the, something in that M phase cytoplasm was causing this nuclei to break down um, and the nuclei, the chromosin, chromatin to condense and then begin to separate. If they took cytoplasm from the cells arrested in G2 and injected those into immature oocytes, well, then nothing happened, right? So this said to them that there was something in the cytoplasm that caused mitosis, and they called it M phase promoting factor or MPF. So this was how MPF was discovered and eventually shown to be one of these cyclin dependent kinases. Okay. So how were the cyclins discovered? Okay, so the, the CDK protein levels stay relatively consistent over time. So this led scientists to think that there must be something else that controls the cyclical nature of the cell cycle. And so there was a researcher working on these sea urchin embryos. And what they saw, and I'll explain this figure, was that there were these proteins called cyclins and their protein expression is shown up here as a single band in this region labeled A. So moving across, this is A. And so what you can see is there's no A and then there's a band, a darkened band, and that's supposed to represent protein A, and then it goes away and then it comes back. So here's this quantification here. So they found that protein A started to go up and then it went down and then it went up and then it went down. And what was interesting is that they, at the same time, they were following the cell division of these, of these cells. And they found that when this peaked, when protein A peaked, cell division would occur and then it, protein A would drop off. And then again, when it peaked, cell division would occur and then protein A would drop off. And this is in contrast to this other protein, protein B shown here, where this just continued to increase throughout the cell cycle. So this protein at least correlated with cell division, but it wasn't really known if it was required for mitosis. So that brings me to the next group of experiments. Okay, so the question that the scientists posed was, is the expression of cyclin required for MPF activity? So again, they brought back the frog oocytes to do this experiment. And their experiment was that, their hypothesis was that cyclin protein is required, is the required component of MPF activity. Okay, and then their null hypothesis is the opposite, right? The cyclin protein is not a requirement of MPF activity. So what they did is they took cell extracts from these immature oocytes. And these immature oocytes had been activated to undergo the cell cycle. And what they did was they destroyed all the mRNA in those cell extracts. So in the absence of mRNA, the cell cycle was halted. Okay, so this has all the components of a cell except for any mRNA, okay? And then what they did was they took those extracts and they added back just a little bit of cyclin mRNA. And so over time, they took out different, we call them aliquots, and they looked to see if cyclin protein was made and then whether or not that correlated with MPF activity. Okay, so cyclin here is the only thing that's being added. There's no other protein that could be doing this. Okay, so they did this 
And what they saw was that over time, the ribosomes picked up that mRNA and began to make protein. And that's shown here as this band um, on this gel, and this band represents cyclin. And then they did a separate assay looking at the kinase activity of MPF. And what they saw was that here in blue is the cyclin protein, and you can see it's building up in, in interphase. And when it's added back, it can cause this peak production of MPF activity. So with cyclin, right, you get MPF activity, but it is degraded again, so it will go down after M phase is complete. And when it goes down again, the MPF activity goes away. So this led them to conclude, as I pointed out earlier, that cyclin, right, it is the protein that is cyclical in expression, and it controls the activity of CDK, okay? So it begins, cyclin, in this case for MPF, begins building up in S, or in G1 and S and G2, and then it plummets again in M phase, okay? So what you might be noticing is that this protein is building up in S and G2, but it's not active, right, until the cell reaches M phase, okay? So why, why isn't it turned on? Well, we know now that further regulation is needed to turn on the CDK. And that regulation comes in the form of phosphorylation. So for a protein, for CDK to be activated, we need an activating phosphate to be added. And that's shown here as this yellow circle with the P. And we need two inhibitory phosphates to be removed. So there's a separate phosphorylation site when these are added this protein is not active. And so here I made a diagram that I think might represent this a little bit better. So what happens as this protein cyclin is building up is that it's gonna to bind to the CDKs. And the CDK is going to be phosphorylated at this region here, this ty these tyrosines, um, and it's gonna be phosphorylated twice at these tyrosines. And that's going to make it so this protein can't phosphorylate its substrates. At the same time, the activating phosphorylation is added. Okay, so here in this black box is this active site. And what happens is when this residue is phosphorylated, it pulls this loop out of the active site. So in theory, substrates could bind, but they're blocked by these inactivating phos phosphates. And then late in G2, these inhibitory phosphates are removed. And so this is what a fully active CDK cyclin combination would look like. So you have its activating phos phosphate, but no inhibitory phosphates. So once it's active, the MPF will have a number of targets. And these might make sense if you went back and looked at the last lecture. So one of its targets are the condensin proteins. So it's gonna phosphorylate them and activate them, and it's gonna make the chromatin condense. Um, it's also gonna target lamin proteins, those intermediate filaments, and it's gonna cause them to disassemble from one another. So it's gonna phosphorylate the lamin, and when it phosphorylates the lamin, we don't see those dimers stack up. And so basically the lamin falls apart in the nucleus, and this helps with nuclear disassembly. It also targets proteins involved in the formation of the mitotic spindle, as well as proteins involved in microtubule polymerization and depolymerization. So this protein, by phosphorylating a bunch of targets, it mediates all the steps of mitosis. Okay, so how is this protein turned off? So it's turned off by negative feedback. So MPF is is targeted by an enzyme that's activated late in anaphase. And what this enzyme does is it's going to tag the cyclin subunits with a small with these small proteins called ubiquitin. And this is going to target them for destruction by the cell's proteasome, which is basically, I think of it as like the cell's um, uh, trash compactor, right? It's just going to chew up everything um, and spit out the pieces. So that's how MPF is turned off. Okay, so we've talked about how 
CDKs and cyclins work and experimental evidence that helps show us how they work. So now we're gonna transition to talk about checkpoints and the relationship to the development of cancer. So critical points in the cell cycle are regulated and regulatory proteins help the cell to decide whether or not to proceed with cell division. And defects in these checkpoint pathways can lead to uncontrolled cell division and cancer. So let's talk about these critical points at which the cell cycle is regulated. And there are four checkpoints. So you should be able to recall the four different checkpoints and what happens at each stage. So the first one I'll talk about is this checkpoint that ha happens late in G1. And so a cell is going to determine whether the following things exist. Okay, so first it has to decide if the cell size is adequate. It has to decide if nutrients are sufficient. It has to decide if social signals are present and that the DNA is undamaged. So if the answer to all of these is yes, then the cell will pass the checkpoint and enter into S phase. The protein that regulates this checkpoint for DNA, ask, looking for DNA damage is called P53. And we'll get to what P53 does in just a second. The next checkpoint happens at the end of G2. And in this checkpoint, the cell looks at if the chromosomes have replicated successfully, again looks to see if the DNA is undamaged, and looks to see if MPF is present. If the chromosomes have not replicated successfully or the DNA is damaged, then that inhibitory phosphate on CDK is not removed and the cells do not enter into M phase. Okay, so M phase has two checkpoints and these are the final two checkpoints. So the first checkpoint looks to see if during metaphase, the chromosomes, every single one, has attached to the spindle apparatus. So this stage determines whether the cells will go from metaphase into anaphase. If there is a single chromosome that is not attached, those cells will arrest in metaphase. The second checkpoint occurs um, in the anaphase to telophase transition. So this will check if the chromosomes have properly segregated and MPF is absent. So these are the four major checkpoints in the cell and what occurs at each one of those steps. So the checkpoint I wanna talk a little bit more about is this G1 checkpoint. And specifically, I'm gonna talk about the checkpoint, the parts of the checkpoint that monitor for DNA damage and monitor for social signals. So if the DNA is physically damaged, then this P53 protein is gonna activate this pathway that will either pause the cell cycle until the damage can be repaired or initiate apoptosis. And apoptosis is a term that describes programmed cell death. So the cell will be removed from the body. P53 is an example of a tumor suppressor. And that we call it a tumor suppressor because it will prevent cell division from occurring unchecked. Damage to the P53 protein or mutation to the P53 protein can lead to uncontrolled cell division. At this checkpoint, cells also monitor for social signals. Social control is the cell's ability to respond from signals from other cells, meaning that they only will divide when it benefits the whole organism. And social control is usually based on sensing growth factors. And these are small proteins that stimulate cell division. Cells in culture will, will not grow unless serum containing those growth factors is added. And if those growth factors are around, this allows the cells to pass that G1 checkpoint. And this involves these proteins called E2F and RB, which I'll talk about in just a second. But cancer cells develop mutations that allow them to divide without social control. So just yet another way that cancer cells fail to utilize their checkpoints. Okay, so let's take a look at what E2F and RB do during the G1 checkpoint. 
So if a cell senses growth signals, so here's our growth factors, those cells will begin to produce two things. It will produce E2F, shown here, which is a transcription factor, and our cyclins, okay? At this point, these are not the MPF cyclins. These are the ones that are gonna begin to, to initiate proteins involved in DNA replication because we're before, right before S phase. Those cyclins will become activated. So here we have our activating phosphate, but then inhibited. Okay, so they're being controlled and held in check. E2F, once it's produced, is bound to this inhibitory protein called RB. And RB, when it's bound to E2F, inactivates it and prevents it from binding to the DNA and acting as a transcription factor. Once the cell um, decides to pass the G1 checkpoint, that inhibitory phosphate is removed and the cyclin CDK becomes activated. It then phosphorylates RB. And when RB is phosphorylated, it changes shape. And when it changes shape, it no longer has affinity for E2F. And so it releases E2F. And then E2F can bind to the promoter for different S phase proteins and trigger their, their production, trigger that gene expression. So E2F then triggers the production of S phase proteins. And we'll talk more about this pathway in class. So we've talked about some of the mutations that occur that might drive cancer, right? Cancer refers to this unchecked cell growth. And there are over 200 types of cancer and 40% of Americans, it's estimated, will develop cancer. But what's common with cancer are defects in tumor suppressors, okay? So an example of that is that cells without P P53 will divide with damaged DNA or cells without RB, which is another tumor suppressor, will divide in the absence of social cues and growth factors. Another possible mutation that can give rise to cancers and, and help cancer cells metastasize throughout the body is the overactivation of proteins involved in cell growth, especially when those proteins should not be active. And we call this group of proteins oncogenes. And some examples of an oncogene is the overactivation of a signaling pathway, especially a growth signaling pathway. And we talked about how if RAS stays permanently bound to GTP, that might be an oncogenic mutation that would cause the cells to divide in the absence of, of appropriate social signals. Another oncogene could be the overproduction of cyclins or mistimed production of cyclins, and that could cause um, unchecked cell growth. So to summarize what I've said so far, the cell cycle is controlled by cyclins and CDKs, and cyclin CDKs are subject to regulation. Protein destruction turns off cyclin, and phosphorylation turns on and off CDKs. Critical points of the cell cycle are regulated by social cues, DNA damage, and the separation of genetic material, and defects in the cell cycle checkpoints can lead to cancer. And so that's it for this video, and I look forward to seeing everyone in class. Thanks. Bye.